The name of this workshop is The Five Biggest Legal Mistakes That Startups Make. My name is Scott Edward Walker. We're being filmed today, so I'll wave to the camera here. Uh, I didn't expect that. So um, I've done a couple of these workshops before, and what I was going to do is come up with five new, new mistakes, but last night I kind of sat down. I get calls all the time for entrepreneurs and startups. Anybody here an entrepreneur working on any startups? Okay, good. Yeah, so I got a different perspective. I'm a lawyer. I'm a corporate lawyer. Um, I have a little boutique firm here in, based here in San Francisco. We got about 12 lawyers, and we work you know, exclusively with startups and entrepreneurs. So my perspective is completely different than yours. I get these calls all the time from entrepreneurs and startups, sort of problems, right? Problems could be caused for any number of reasons. Either A, they kind of did the legal stuff on their own or they haven't even done the legal stuff. B, they used a lawyer, but the lawyer wasn't very good. Or C, they maybe they used a website like LegalZoom or some other website. So there's any number of you know, permutations to this. But what I did last night is I kind of sat down and I kind of figured out like, what are like the five most common mistakes, the calls I'm getting on for the last six months? This way I can come in here today and just sort of share them with you so that you know, hopefully you don't make the same mistakes. Some of the mistakes are fixable and some of them aren't. You know, and the ones that aren't we call deadly mistakes and you just you can't fix it. So we'll talk about that. So mistake number one is forming the wrong entity. Okay? The world of startups, I've said this many times, I've written about this. Those of you who have you know, re read legal blogs should be familiar with this. The world of startups is the world of corporations. Okay? not LLCs. You want to form a corporation in Delaware. This is not rocket science. This is just how the game is played for a number of reasons. Number one, that's where the investors want you to, that's the, what the investors want you to be, a corporation in Delaware. And we'll talk about the two things. Number two, uh, it just makes it a lot easier going forward in terms of issuing equity to employees, to co-founders, to future investors. So you don't want to be an LLC. This is, what, this is the call I get all the time, okay? I'm an LLC. Not only the LLC, I might be an LLC in California or Florida or Nevada. Why are people LLCs? I don't know. Accountants tell them to do it. It's a lot easier than a corporation because a corporation you have a lot of different documents. In an LLC, it's basically two documents. There's a certificate or some articles of formation which you can just go on LegalZoom or some site and they do it for you. And then there's an operating agreement, which many entrepreneurs don't even execute. An operating agreement can be about 80 or 90 pages. And what it is, it's a compilation of all the corporate documents you need folded into one document with this extraordinary complicated tax layer on top of it. So LLCs are really for hedge fund guys and private equity guys and real estate guys who want to take advantage of the significant flexibility with respect to tax distributions and tax allocations and it's not the world of startups you know basically startups are going to be losing money for any number of years and you're putting any all the revenue back into the company you're raising money putting it back into the company so these aren't really issues that are relevant to startups and again with a corporation so what happens with an LLC you try to issue for example stock options well there's no such things really in LLCs it's called it's called a profits interest, and no, no one knows what the hell a profits interest is. So it just becomes very complicated. The most important reason why you don't want to use LLCs, not to beat this to death, but investors, VCs, hey, Jason. Hey, this is big Jason. Come on up here for the camera. <laughs> uh, he's the guy who's running the show here. Um, LLCs are a pass-through entity. Does anybody know what a pass-through entity is? Yes. We, you, had, you had an answer? Okay. You know what a pass-through entity is? Yeah, it passes on the, uh, the profits directly to the owners, so they get taxed on Right, exactly. The profits and the losses are allocated directly to the owners. So it, it, there may be like one in a hundred or one in a thousand uh, sort of uh, startups that have a situation where they're generating so much cash flow, so much profit, so that after they've even paid themselves salaries, all the co-founders, uh, after they've taken all that extra cash and put it back into the business, there's so much cash left that they're going to dividend it out to themselves, and in which case there would be double taxation in a corporation. A corporation would already have paid a tax. This is a very unusual situation, but I'm just trying to explain to you this so-called double taxation issue that sometimes I hear. I, people say, oh, I don't want to be in a corporation or C corporation because uh, you know, the double taxation, they don't really quite understand, you know, what they're saying. But, but in any event, um, VCs, and invest, they don't invest in pass-through entities. 
So even if you form an LLC, if you're doing well and you're reaching out to investors and you're meeting with the VC, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to convert to a corporation anyway, and that can be expensive. So anyway, that's, that's the reason you want to be a corporation. Now, why Delaware? Everyone says, well, I'm in California or I'm in Florida. I'm here. Why do I am forming a corporation in Delaware? And the answer is really for historical reasons. Delaware, 100 plus years ago, decided they're going to become the state for, for, for corporations just to raise money. And they have a special court system. They have a special set of laws. They have the most protections for management and for directors. And so again, this is where the investors are going to want you to be. If you don't play the game and you're trying to go out and raise money, you have to have a certain level of credibility and sophistication. So when you talk to investors and, they, and you tell them you're an LLC in California, right away there's a red flag. And they're not going to generally invest in you until you clean that up. Sometimes it's a post-closing condition, but they're going to require you then to become a Delaware corporation. Even on AngelList, if any of you guys are familiar with AngelList, you'll see they require you to be a Delaware corporation to actually sign up. So again, spend a lot of time on this, but this is not rocket science. Become a Delaware corporation. And then one little wrinkle here, C Corp versus S Corp. Traditionally, you always wanted to just start off as a C corporation. There's something called qualified small business stock. I don't want to get too complicated. As of, December, as of January 1st of this year, it's sort of disappeared. Hopefully, Congress comes back and, and, and will um, you know, grant this same tax break that's been given. It, it means, essentially, if you form a C corporation and you issue shares to the founders and the founders hold those shares for five years or more, you can't be an S corp, you can't be an LLC, and if you hold your shares for five years or more and sell your company, have a big result, you pay zero capital gains up to $10 million. So it's one of the few things that Congress did last year to help entrepreneurs. It's been on and off for the last five or 10 years. Unfortunately, it's back off, at least temporarily, as of January 1st. But I want you to be familiar with, usually it's kind of a no-brainer, just form the C-Corp. So that's mistake number one. Anybody have any questions on that? I know we covered a lot of ground there to just give you that one mistake. You had a question? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. We, so, so this is the call I get all the time, and there's really, three, very quickly, three ways of handling it. If you just did it, like literally like a month ago, hey, I just did this because my accountant told me, a lot of accountants will say be an LLC, right, because it creates a, <laughs> creates, creates a lot of work for them, you know, more work at least because you've got to do K-1s and it gets complicated. If you just did it like a month ago, I'll say, you know what, just dissolve it yourself, you know, using LegalZoom or whatever, and then we'll just start fresh. We have something called a startup. I'm not here to sort of you know, pitch this, but we have something called a startup package, which is really, um, it's just a flat fee or a fixed fee, and we set you up perfectly, Delaware Corporation, then you qualify to do business in California, and then you have a whole bunch of documents, which we'll talk about, restricted stock purchase agreement, IP assignment. So we do all that for uh, $2,000 plus filing fees. So the reason I say this is because I'll say some, hey, just, you know, dissolve your LLC, and then come back to us, we'll do the startup package. Sometimes you've been an LLC for a year or two, you can't just dissolve it. So now you have one of two ways. It just depends on which state. There's something called a conversion, which is much easier. You literally convert. You have a couple of forms you file with the Secretary of State, say, of California, and the Secretary of State of Delaware, and presto, the LLC becomes a corporation in Delaware. Some states don't permit conversions, in which case you have to do these full-blown, I've done all these, full-blown merger, which is a real pain in the ass. So now I got an LLC, say, in, I don't know, Washington. I have to set up my new Delaware corporation. Now I have to merge the two. I have to, you know, it's just a lot of documents for nothing. So now instead of 2,000, it's 5,000 or 6,000 or 7,000. So anyway, that's a mistake that is fixable, fortunately. Uh, we've had situations of an LLC converting to a C corp. Maybe five years they've been around. They put debt on the uh, LLC, and as a result, it must have been like 10 or 15,000 just for tax lawyers coming in and trying to figure it all out because LLCs are so complicated. So. So that's mistake number one. Any other questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, I, when I was talking about my idea, I was advised that forming an LLC is the very first thing I should do because it, one of the things I have to do in my due diligence is um, accept liability for what I'm doing. And they said, do you want limited liability? So you want to limit your liability in this, in this venture. So that's, they were advising me to do an LLC. So Who? I was in the start of the process. Who's they? Who said no? Just about the people I was talking to. Oh, OK. Yeah, no, that, the advice you got to, to try to protect yourself from personal liability is very good advice. It could be done in one of two ways, either a corporation 
or an LLC. A corporation actually probably provides more of a shield than an LLC. There's some case law out there, particularly with a single member LLC. So if I went ahead and formed an LLC by myself, I can be what's called a disregarded entity for tax purposes. So I just take all the profits and losses, put it on a Schedule C. Some courts are saying, wait a second, you're not really a separate entity, and they'll pierce that veil. So you've got to be careful as a single member LLC. But that, from a legal protection perspective, I mean, if anything, a corporation is be more of a protection. Um, so let's go to mistake number two, okay? Here, here's the mistake. It's not buttoning down IP ownership issues. So I assume most of you are working on you know, sort of software space, web space, a lot of intellectual property issues. This comes up all the time in the context of investors coming in like VCs or you're trying to sell the company. The lawyers representing the acquirer or representing the VC are going to do significant due diligence. And one of the first things they're going to look at is the fact that, you know, whether you own the intellectual property, whether you own the code, the design, all that stuff. I mean, it sounds simple. Of course I own it, right? I mean, well, not, not so fast. I mean, because there are certain issues. One of the problems that may arise is what I call the sort of moonlighting problem. And what do I mean by that? A lot of, a lot of guys, they, they might be currently employed and they start working on their startup and thinking, oh, you know, I'll just kind of do this on the side. But that's the question. Are you really doing it on the side and moonlighting? Because what the law says, and California is the most favorable state for employees, but California, like all states, most states will say, if you're actually using the facilities of your employer, so if you use, you're at work using their computer, even if you're using their phone, if you're using their facilities, then they may have rights to your intellectual property, meaning they actually own it. The other issue is in, um, if you're actually doing something in their space, and you, you can't do that. So, so California is very pro-employee. It says to an employee, no matter what you sign, this is very good if you're in California, you're working at an employer. It doesn't matter what you sign, because they're going to have you sign all kinds of documents and this and that. As long as you're actually moonlighting, you're not using their facilities, you're doing it at home, late at night, you're doing it on the weekends, and again, you're not in their space, and so if I'm doing... I'm working for a company that develops mobile apps and I create a mobile app, well, that's not good, right? So, and you can't utilize your work product. So if you're working there, and you, oh, wow, this is a great idea. I see this. And then you kind of start working on that. So, so that's the issue. It's the moonlighting issue. You have to be very careful. It's coming up all the time. Now, you can get a waiver from your employer. A lot of times we'll get the call, hey, uh, you know, we've been working on this. I've been employed at, I just had a call yesterday. Literally, the guy said he's employed at Cisco. Another guy was at Google. Uh, it turned out there may be some issues. If you're in a good, you know, good relationship with your supervisor, the boss, I said, look, why don't you go tell them what you're up to? They can execute a waiver, basically say, we're going to waive any rights that we may have to intellectual property. Does anybody have that issue or seen that issue where they're actually working for um, an employer and um, have uh, started working on their startup? Have you had that no, problem? No. Okay, good. Second issue with, employ with intellectual property is what I call the Zuckerberg issue, which is that the, some third-party developer like Mark Zuckerberg or a co-founders don't actually assign their rights to the company. And so the way this is done is something called, you may have heard of this, a confidential information and invention assignment agreement. That's part of our startup package. That's pretty basic. All the sophisticated law firms will requi require the co-founders to sign that document. So you're essentially any intellectual property you create, any code, any designs, anything. Sometimes you'll go out and get the domain name in your own name. So you'll get all that intellectual property into the company. The problem with, with a lot of entrepreneurs is they haven't incorporated. They might have reached out like the Winklevoss twins to somebody else to help them code up a site. So Mark Zuckerberg gets pulled in. He's coding up this site. He decides, I, you know, I don't know whose idea it was, whatever, but he kind of pulls away and then he does his thing, the, the quote unquote, the Facebook. These guys are saying, wait a second, this guy stole our fucking idea, right? And they sue him. Well, had he signed that document, it's a pretty basic document, there's really no issue here. Mark would have essentially assigned all of his rights to the intellectual property he created in connection with the project to the, to the company or to the, to the twins. So, but he didn't sign that document, so that's really why they ended up litigating and they settled. I don't know what the settlement was, but uh, something like that, yeah. And they still, uh, they may still be kicking around on something. But that, so, so the lesson here, again, is 
you got to kind of button down this IP issue. I always tell people early on, and I know it's a pain in the ass. I know a lot of guys will say, hey, I just want to see if this thing's going to play out, if I get any traction. I don't want to have to pay a fucking lawyer. I don't want to incorporate. I don't want to do that. But that's where a lot of the problems arise. Because for you know, 2,900 bucks at my firm, I'm sure other firms have similar things. You're, just, you're sort of nailing all these issues and it's done. Because the issues don't go away. Now that's the thing. Like with IP, okay, I got a guy in India who helped me, or a guy in Ukraine, a guy in Russia, a guy in China, right? All of a sudden, it's three, six months down the road, oh God, we never got an assignment agreement from that guy. He like did our site, or he did the app. Or here's another one, Startup Weekend, four or five guys getting together, and then two guys decide, oh, we're gonna go forward with the project. Well, maybe the two other guys coded up the site and you haven't gotten, so this may be solvable, it may not. We've seen situations where, um, you know, two guys have worked together, one guy split, and he was the you know, developer. He's like, I don't want anything to do with your project. I'm not signing anything, you know, or, you know, pay me $200,000. So you got to be careful there. Uh, any questions in the intellectual property area? Okay, good. Yeah, I have a question for Okay. So, probably you will talk about this later also. What do you think about creating a patent and uh, at least for the startup? Because the technology is changing so rapidly that a patent can be bypassed easily with something that comes up new. Yeah, it's a good question. So we get that all the time. I'm not a patent lawyer. Patent is so complicated. I mean, it's so expensive, too. So I hear this, you know, provisional patents, $1,500. The problem with patents is, I mean, as you see, even the, the biggest, most successful companies are battling. So um, I, I'm, I'm from the theory of just, you know, get out and execute. I don't know if these patents are even worth anything. Let's assume you get a patent. So what does that do? So now you have a patent war. You're going to fight Google or Apple or, I mean, so they can squash you if they wanted to. So I think the money, you know, to spend fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 on a patent is probably better utilized and, you know, just maybe bringing in an engineer or getting someone involved uh, to help you, you know, execute. I mean, that's, that's my thinking from a business perspective. From a legal perspective, I mean, obviously, you know, that, that's, it's helpful, uh, but it doesn't, you know, it's not bulletproof. You get the patent wars. So, you know, the patent stuff is very frustrating. Because, I mean, that's the reality. From a practical perspective, you know, this is our legal system. The big guys out there can literally, you know, if they wanted to, just squash you. I mean, what do I mean by that? Because they, they, can, they can drag out litigation. You can spend two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, literally. And how, how are you going to do that? I mean, you hear these horror stories. Now, sometimes if, with some of the good VC firms, I think First Round was involved in something with a patent, you know, they'll get behind you and help you, and they may even, you know, fund the litigation. But um, I think you just, you just got to execute. Yeah, but it's a good question. Um, mistake number three. Okay, now we're moving into an area called vesting. Okay, Here, here's the mistake. I get this call. This one, this one kills me. This one, again, may not be fixable. It's uh, two, three guys got together. They launched their startup. It's now six months down the road, a year down the road. Maybe they formed the corporation on legal zone. Maybe they formed an LLC. But what they didn't do is set up vesting schedules. So for those who aren't familiar with vesting schedules, it's pretty standard. It's not rocket science. What it means is that... Uh, with two guys using that example, say we say, hey, we're going to split our equity 50-50. You don't just get the 50% and I own my 50%. You kind of earn it over four years. It vests on a monthly basis. So if, for example, one co-founder leaves in six months, and using that example, you would take 66 divided by 48, which is one-eighth, and he had 50%. So he would keep roughly 6% and the other 44% would be purchased by the company and go back to the company. So now the company can go forward, you can get other people involved. Otherwise, he now splits three months, six months, for whatever reason. Maybe he just wants to get married, he moves to Florida, moves to Hawaii. It wouldn't be fair for him to keep half the company, right? Or three guys, a third, a third, a third. And that's the issue, you know? And so what happens there? Well, if you don't have vesting schedule, the only thing you could do is try to negotiate with him or her and try to get your shares back, but sometimes that could be contentious, right? Particularly if people haven't left on good terms. One guy tries to screw the other guy. T you know, fuck you, man. I got my 50%. You know, see ya. Now what? So that, that's a tough one. Vesting, so as I said, it's typically a four-year schedule. The other thing is when and VCs come in, let's say you're doing really well. You've raised a little money. You've gotten some traction. Now your angel investor introduced you to some VCs. They're, they're psyched. They're going to go forward. They're also going to require you, as a lot of founders don't understand this, even if you haven't set up a vesting schedule, they're going to say to you, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll put in two million bucks, but you're going to set up a four-year vesting schedule. You're like, wait a second, that, that means I'm kind of giving back my shares in the sense that that's right. Because they're, they're investing in you, they want you there. So if I've gone ahead initially, 
today and set up my vesting schedule, when I talk to the VCs a year down the road, year, they might say, okay, cool, you got this in place, so it just, you know, we'll just run out for the other three years. So that's another reason to do that. Again, typically four years on a monthly basis. Um, this is all part of what's called a restricted stock purchase agreement. So when you set up your corporation, you're actually going to purchase your shares from the corporation. Usually it's a, it's a nominal price. And as part of that purchase, that's when it's a very lengthy document, it's about 15 pages called restricted stock, and that's where we set up the vesting schedules. Okay? Sometimes one founder may have worked on the project for six months or a year and brings in somebody else. It may be appropriate for him or her to have uh, some form of pre-vesting where they say get credit for their year's work. So they would get some vesting up front. Um, there may be a situation, I don't recommend it, but sometimes you go out, you're hustling, trying to get a co-founder, someone introduces you to somebody. I mean, choosing your co-founder is the most important decision you can make. Ideally, I mean, Paul Graham and others have talked about this. You want to work with people you've worked with before. You want to work with maybe friends from high school or college. If that's not possible, then you may say to your, this co-founder, you know, I have 70%, I'll give you 30%, you'll vest over four years. But the first year, there'll be a one-year cliff, meaning I want you to prove yourself for a year first, and then you'll kick in and get your 25% tranche and the monthly. So that's called a one-year cliff. You might have heard that. The other issue with vesting that you should be familiar with, and again, it's baked into these restricted stock purchase agreements, is acceleration. This is an important issue. The VCs always negotiate this. What happens if there's a change of control? This is all good stuff, right? You have investors, you sell your company, but you still have a couple years left in terms of your vesting, what, what happens with that? I mean, because in a sense, if I had 50% and now I'm selling my company after two years and I only have 25%, well, that's not fair to me. You're selling a company. And so there may be, there's acceleration. The issue is, is there, uh, is there a single trigger or a double trigger? I don't want to get too complicated, but these are important issues. A single trigger means change of control, boom. I accelerate and I basically get my full 50% what I started with. You know, if I, it was a 50-50 split, I can sell those. A double trigger, and this is what the VCs and the investors want, they want to basically just assign it to the new company so you don't actually accelerate your vesting unless you're fired for, without cause within the next one year period. So this stuff can get complicated, but I just wanted you to hear this and be familiar with some of these issues. You had a question? No. Well, you can, yeah, that's a good question. Just yeah, so I, and that's a good question. Yeah, because I get that all the time. And it gets a little confusing. So, um, you could, typically, when we, form, when we form the corporation, you file the certificate of incorporation, you authorize a certain number of shares, usually 10 million or 15 million. It doesn't really matter, uh, technically, how many authorize. It's really percentage. I can authorize 100. I can give 50 to you and 50 to me, right? I can authorize 10, five for you, five for me. We still have 50%, but just from um, optics, what over time in the valley, what's developed is you want, want to have a lot. So then I want to go out to an engineer, here's a million options, or here's a million, wow, a million, oh my God. But you know, it's still 10% or whatever it is, 5%. So to your question, what often happens when you incorporate is you'll take out of the 10 million authorized, you'll issue four million collectively to the founders. Depending how you split it, doesn't maybe it's two million, two million, you have three founders. So now I have six million still authorized. Why do I do that? Because maybe down the road, a lot of times down the road, you'll set up the option plan. At that point, you're then going to sort of uh, uh, delegate or assign a certain number of shares to that plan. That's done formally in a board resolution. They sort of now become part of the cap table. By doing that, you've diluted your co you and your co-founder. So this is called the option pool shuffle. I know we're getting really complicated and technical here. This is another huge issue, particularly with investors, because a lot of entrepreneurs don't realize this. When you get a term sheet, a Series A term sheet, what the, what the investors do, they play a little game. If you haven't set up an option pool, they're going to put it in the term sheet, and it's going to come out of your, and essentially you'll get diluted. Is that that's what you meant? Yeah, because I saw, this was a while back, but I've seen like cap tables where they have stuff. Right. Exactly. That's right. Um, and is this, is this something that just came up a while back? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a good question. It gets confusing. I mean, fortunately, in today's environment, everything has changed in the sense that 
the, the pendulum has swung and the leverage, which it used to be like these entrepreneurs, the, uh, the investors, the Series A's investors, the VCs, it was like going to a bank. When um, I used to work at a couple of big firms in New York and even representing huge companies, you go to a bank, a commercial bank for a loan, I don't care if it's for a million dollars or a hundred million dollars, it's basically, you know, here's our 120 page document, you sign over here. But we can't negotiate anything because our credit committee won't allow, you know, it's like, the most onerous provisions you can imagine. Well, it kind of used to be that way in, in, you know, in here in Silicon Valley, believe it or not. I mean, a lot of this, these terms, they're so complicated, and a lot of entrepreneurs didn't even understand, you know, this is years. Then, all of a sudden, you get the world of sort of social media and blogging and guys like, you know, Venture Hacks guys and Paul Graham and Mark Suster and others who have just opened up this world to entrepreneurs. And by doing that, by having this information, uh, and then, of course, with the accelerators, and there's so many entrepreneurs and startups out there that, you know, are creating competitive environments. Now, all of a sudden, you know, it's it's a little bit different in terms of negotiating leverage. So, uh, and a lot of these terms and things like the option pool shuffle and 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 all these other tricks that these investors used to do, liquidation preferences, it's it's kind of out in the open, and people are more familiar with it. So, uh, but that's a very good point, and it can be tricky. What you want to do as an entrepreneur is try to keep that option pool as small as possible and sit down with your investor and say, wait a second, I don't need a 20% or 25% pool. Why? Because I'm the CEO, so we don't have to, we don't have to bring in a CEO and, and do 10% there. And you sort of sit down and say, all we need is a little pool, 10%, because it's all coming out of your pocket anyway. So that's, that's the way that's typically done, and it's, it's an important term. Um, what else did you have? The only other Mm -hmm. are, you know, advisors that provide a lot of value in that. Right. Um, one of the ways that we're looking, you know, being a bootstrap company currently, one of the ways we're looking to um, provide them, you know, with some incentive down the line or to keep them in track is to give them, you know, a little very equity. small, you know, you know, a little piece yeah. of the pie, a small piece. Um, is that something on a case, I mean, obviously on a person that's a case-by-case -case basis, but is there some sort of standard yeah, that's a good question. We get that all the time in terms of allocating. Uh, for advisors, I mean, I just had this conversation about an hour ago, like 0.25 to 1% typically, depending on the role they're playing. And you usually get an advisory agreement, probably set it up for like a one or two year vesting, so they're, you know, they're there. But you're right, it's a case-by-case -case basis. You don't want to give them too much. Um, you know, sometimes you bring in guys just because they're, you know, they're high profile and having their name associated with your company is a good thing. I mean, that's a good thing. Listen, it's it's tough as hell to raise money. I know everyone talks about it, but it's still tough. You know, going out there, trying to raise money, you got to bang on a lot of doors. The trick is really finding that sort of that one hype, like a Jason Calacanis type guy, who then becomes sort of your rabbi. You know, he's the guy who's going to publicize you, and that's the way it works. It's sort of social proof. That's the term they use, or an anchor tenant. You find that one person, that's the magic, and then everyone else. Because if I go to a bunch of investors and say, hey, I got Jason investing, Jason Calacanis, they'll be like, wow, great, I'm in, right? And that's the way the game's played. It's hard, but that's the job of the entrepreneur, going out and hustling and, uh, you know, banging on doors, never giving up. That's how it's done because you get that one breakthrough, and then all of a sudden the whole world opens up. So um, mistake number four, I know this is getting technical and complicated, and uh, no one likes dealing with lawyers. I know that. But, again, I have the other, I have a different perspective. I mean, I, the problem is I see, I don't say this, you know, to be, uh, you know, arrogant in any respect. It's just that a lot of these problems could have been solved early on. I think there's a thing, you know, one of the things that troubles me is this thinking like I can just launch a startup with no money, you know. I mean, it doesn't work that way, okay. And if you go back, I mean, just, I was just thinking the other day, like a guy wants, a guy opened up a restaurant near where I live. I mean, think about how much capital that took. You know, you have to get the space, got to sign a damn lease, first month, last month, deposit. He's got to now do all the you know, reconstruction within. He's got to hire employees. I mean, so right away, hundred, two hundred thousand. So the point being, I mean, the beauty with uh, the web and these apps, I mean, you don't have to worry about any of that. But you still, you still got to got you know, put aside five, whatever, five thousand, ten thousand. Get a good lawyer. Get a good accountant. You know, just just nail that stuff down. Just think of it that way. Think of it like, okay, I, I need at least five thousand just to get a lawyer and accountant involved, set this up right. So now I don't have to deal with these issues anymore, right? As opposed to. I'll just kind of wing it and deal with this stuff down the road. Well, that's, that's just not a prudent way of approaching it. So, you know, maybe stay in your job a little longer. Maybe, you know, borrow money from somebody, mom or dad or whatever. But that's, that's my advice. Um, 
So now we're talking about mistake. This, this comes up all the time. Again, unfortunately, it's just not complying with securities laws. What a nasty area. I mean, we could spend you know, literally three or four hours talking about securities laws. But the, the problem here is that uh, there are two issues, OK? Number one, you want, to, you want to raise money from accredited investors. Does everybody know what that term, accredited investors? Anybody heard that term, accredited investors? Just rich guys, OK? There's a lot of stuff in the news, on blogs, about it. The, the securities laws are kind of fluid right now. We have crowdfunding, which is, an, which is an, an exception to the accredited investor rule. It hasn't been promulgated yet. The rules for the SEC were still waiting. Still waiting. I think it's two years now. Uh, I'm not a big fan of what they've created. I mean, it's just, it's just a mess. It's going to cost a fortune for entrepreneurs just to raise a million. You're going to have 100, 200 people in your cap table. So let's put that aside. The idea here is that you've got to go out and deal with people who have a million dollars in net worth or more, not including their primary residence, or they're making $200,000 a year for the last two years. And they're going to actually sign a questionnaire. And then they're actually going to sign whatever purchase agreement, whether it's a, if you're, if you're uh, issuing convertible notes, they sign the note purchase agreement and represent that they're accredited. Uh, if, the, if it's a seed um, preferred, a uh, serious seed, same thing. The reason that's so important is because it allows you to avail yourself of, of, of this SEC rule 506, not that you need the number, but what that rule says, if you're only dealing with accredited investors, you preempt state law, which means you don't even have to deal with the fucking state regulators. They're the guys who cause all the problems. So how does it, if I have investors in four different states, if they weren't accredited, I'd have to deal with each of those state regulators, and I may even have to provide the investors with a private placement memo. That's what happens under federal securities law, where you can't afford twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a private placement memo. So that's the beauty of dealing with accredited investors. I preempt state law, so I just have to file a form D with the states, and there's no disclosure requirement. So. This is very important. California is one of the few states that friends and family, there are ways of doing it. If they're not accredited, there's a relationship with the company. But it does get very tricky, and there are certain limitations on how much you can raise. So that's kind of the first rule. I just had this conversation yesterday. A guy called me up from Virginia, and he told me he has, you know, quote, unquote, friends and families who bought securities. He raised $200,000, and he heard from somebody that, you know, it's a problem if they're not accredited. One guy's in Ohio, one guy's in Maine, one guy. So, I said, listen, I'm happy to help you, but you got a real problem. You haven't complied with securities laws. You know, we'd, have to, we'd have to offer these people what's called a rescission offer. They get an opportunity, essentially, to get their money back plus interest. That's what happens. So people ask me, well, how is anyone going to find out? Here's the question, you know, which is a kind of a silly question, but OK, I've broken the law, but how is someone going to find out? Well, the answer is it's a disgruntled investor. And over the course of my 18 years of practicing law, I mean, this has come up, whew, probably over 20, 30 times. Someone's upset, right? They, they say, where the fuck's my money? I gave you $100,000. I want my money. It's like, what you, I'm a startup. I don't mean we're still trying to you know, make it happen. Well, you know, he talks to some lawyer. Next thing you know, he goes to some state commissioner. I'm not accredited, and that's the end of the game. I mean, then you're in trouble. You know? And then the commissions, what they're going to do, they're going to make you unwind it. You're going to have to pay a fine. You're going to have to pay back this guy plus interest. I mean, there are situations where if it's so egregious, they might even pursue you know, criminal violations. So just be, just be really careful with securities laws. I don't think that, I know it's hard to raise money, but if I just follow like one, if there's one takeaway from this, just you know, get a lawyer involved to help you and then just focus on accredited investors. Hey, how you doing? You here for the uh, workshop? Oh, great. So we're up mistake number five, so you missed a few. That's just as well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Did you form an LLC? Me? Yes. Originally, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you're one for one. Let's see. Uh, did you button down IP ownership issues? Did you sign like a company? Nope. OK, two for two. <laughs> Let's see. I ended up getting sued over that one. Keep going. Oh my god. <laughs> well, you should come up here, and we'll have like an interview. Uh, did you set up vesting schedules with your co-founder? Nope. Wow. OK, here's an easy one. Did you comply with securities law? No. By that time, we had hired an attorney. All right. OK. So that's good. Actually, three, well, one for four, I guess. OK. You got sued uh, with the IP ownership? Um, IP ownership, ownership, vesting schedule. Oh, my. Oh, you timed this perfectly. This is great. <laughs> These guys are looking at me like, oh, another fucking lawyer. I can't deal with this. 
He doesn't know what he's, he's making this stuff up. And you walk in and like you've had all these problems. So what happened exactly, if you could tell us in uh, less than 30 seconds? No, I'm kidding. No, in a couple of minutes. Um, you have two lawyers decide to do a startup and they decide they don't need a lawyer and they'll oh. find out about later. And oh, this is a then, mistake then, number six, a lawyer <laughs> representing him or herself. <laughs> oh, so you're a lawyer. So you had to get rid of him or her? Well, I, I, I wasn't prepared to give her 50% of my IP and everything else. Yeah, we just talked and about that, that, yeah. That caused a bit of a conflict because she thought she owned 50%. This is unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> you said this I think, yeah, I set it up. Come on up. This is my <laughs> No, I didn't. I, you were like, this, you had to come to all my workshops. I'm telling you. <laughs> I was just using that example, 50-50, and then someone leaves. Oh. and. Wow. I read all those articles about don't do 50-50. Right. That's, a, that's another one. So, uh, <laughs> but if you had to set up the vesting, well, the problem with 50-50, just to go back to the vesting schedule, it, here's where it becomes tricky because how could she, in effect, fire her co-founder? So that's why people always say it's better to be 60-40 or 51-49. Whoever has the majority ownership, this is getting a little off topic, but you have to understand this. Uh, and this goes back to my original point that Paul Graham says you really have to trust your co-founder and know him or her really well because all this stuff could come up. You gotta be together you know, in the trenches knowing this is gonna be a long endeavor. Because if it's 50-50, who, you know, usually you have two people on the board so you have this potential of the deadlock. If it's 51-49 or 60-40, I'm the majority shareholder, I elect myself to the board, I control the board, I appoint myself CEO. If my co-founder isn't working out, I just get rid of them. You know, under this uh, restricted stock purchase agreement, they're just at will essentially. So understand that, yes? Do you have any recommendations? So if you had two co-founders coming together and one was going to be CEO and the other was going to be something else, um, and you start off with basically a 50-50, how does the person who's not CEO like protect themselves? Yeah, I guess, but, but they would also be on the board, right? That's how they protect themselves. So you'd have the two people on the board. So the board appoints the CEO and, and presumably the you know, chief financial or president. So, but by having the person on the board, um, you could build in some language too. But that's why I'm saying it. you don't really want to spend this kind of time and money. So I get this question all the time, like three guys starting to get one guy saying, hey, I don't, if I'm, I don't want to, if I'm terminated without cause, I want severance and I want acceleration of vesting. That's not really how startups work, okay? I mean, that's why I was saying earlier, it's from a business perspective, choosing that co-founder is so critical because you just, you just want to get it set up properly and move on and try to execute. It's tough enough to try to make your business work than to have to deal with all this legal stuff and trying to create these stockholders agreement and termination without cause and things like that. So uh, it's a good question. 50-50, the way it typically works is both parties then would elect themselves as, off, as uh, directors and then you sort of appoint, appoint officers. It really, really doesn't matter. I mean, but you just don't want a situation where the CEO can kind of fire the uh, CFO or the president. So, uh, yeah. I yeah, actually have two questions in relation to number five. The first was uh, in regard to the accredited investor. Um, number four, investor. yeah. I've heard you talk about, or excuse me, number four. I've heard you talk about that before. Um, but typically when people go out and raise from friends and family first off, um, mm -hmm. let's say you need, you know, kind of a super small angel, even pre-angel, you know, this yeah. be friends and family, but so right. Speak. Is that a problem, or is that something that you already need to start looking to raise to, you know, something a little bit more at an angel realm? Yeah, it's a potential problem. As I was saying, okay, we, it actually this dovetails nicely into mistake number five, which is, uh, and it's it's sort of a business issue, not diligent diligencing your investors, or not sort of figuring out who your investor is, and it relates to a situation where just like this, you're going out and sort of friends and family. In the, in the ideal world, you know, waving the magic wand, who do I want investing in my startup? I'm, I'm, we have two co-founders or three co-founders. I now want to go out and get a sophisticated angel like a Jason Calacanis or a Dave McClure or a Mark Seuss or as I said, not, not so easy. But the reason I, one of the reasons I want those guys, not only to be the social proof we talked about, but the other reason is they know how the game's played. 
So they're investing in 10, 20, 30, 40 startups. If one of them sours, 10 of them sours, 20, this is no issue, right? But when it's Uncle Charlie or your friend from college who doesn't do this stuff, he doesn't even understand how this stuff works. In six months, he's calling you up and saying, where the fuck's my money, right? And you're like, what do you mean? I mean this is a startup, dude, you know? Uh, maybe, you know, if we have an exit in 10 years, you'll get some money. And he's like, well, what the hell? And that's when we get back to sometimes situations like that. They might go to the SEC. They might go to, you know, state regulators. So, again, in California, if I had just, you know, a close friend, someone I trust, a parent, uh, an uncle, there's no issue here, I can probably make it work in California. California is one of the few states that has this sort of relationship exception where if it's a true you know, relationship, friend, family, business relationship, I can then issue stock to them even though they're not accredited. VCs don't like that. Nobody likes to get involved in a company where you have non-accredited investors. It's just not appropriate, okay? Most startups fail, everybody knows that. So it's really a situation where if somebody's not an accredited investor, they don't have a million dollars or more net worth or making 200,000, should they really be investing in startups? And the answer is no. And that's what the SEC said many years ago. And there's been a lot of push to raise this accredited investor net worth test to like 3.4 million. And the income test, it'll probably happen. So, I mean, what the government is essentially saying is that, you know, this is all because of the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, everybody's running around raising money from everybody, and people were wiped out. And so the government stepped in and said, whoa, you know, no more. You know, if you're dealing with un un unaccredited investors, you've got to provide them with a full disclosure document so they understand what they're getting into. So that's kind of the rationale. Yes? I feel like I should hire you now. It's, it's like, I'm, it's, this is like serendipity because I've got two angel investors Oh, yeah. You know, they're, yeah, they've got millions of dollars, but right. they've never done this type of thing. They did stock and bonds and right. uh, real estate and so forth, but I convinced them to <laughs> take a chunk of change into it. Well, you're a good salesman, then. That's so a good stuff. So are you? Or what do I do? Do I direct them to an angel fund so they become accredited? Or? Well, um... I mean, I'm not trying to get free advice here. <laughs> oh, no. Well, in terms of, you know, tiers of, you know, so you think about it in terms of, as I said earlier, waving a magic wand, the ideal investor is that high-profile, sophisticated angel. You know, we all dream of getting involved in our project. Uh, underneath is sort of, you know, a sophisticated, someone who does this a lot, 10, 20 investment. Underneath that, he's still accredited. Maybe this is sort of your guy. He still has the million dollars of net worth, not including the primary residence, or making 200000 a year. So he's still accredited, but they just don't play this game. They're going to they're have to execute a questionnaire sort of saying to the company, you know, hey, you know, we are accredited, here's why. And then, they, as I said, they're gonna, in the actual documents, they're going to represent a warrant to the company that they're accredited. So, you know, I think it's more of a practical issue. What you're saying is these guys' expectations may not be sort of what the typical expectations of a sophisticated angel are because they're only doing one investment. Angels uh, know that they have to have at least 20, 30 investments to, to make this work. It's a diversity because I think, you know, the numbers are such that I think 50, 60 percent don't work out. Maybe 20 percent are sort of, you know, walking dead, they call them, and then one, you know, 10 percent, um, 20 percent, you know, were actually hit. The, the models, you know, if you think about it, the, the model that VCs and angel investors use is they're looking for that home run to basically cover everything. So it's one home run out of 30 investments that covers, every, you know, or two home runs or three. That's the way they're playing this game. That's why they, you know, they have so many. That no, nobody knows early on who's going who's to work out, who's not. I mean, if, if you look at the history of these companies, I mean, I've studied all this from Google to Facebook, I mean, to even Twitter. I mean, it's, a lot of it's just serendipity. I mean, had, I mean, at Twitter, you know, had these guys not worked out at Odeo, they wouldn't have reached around and said, what other projects can we work on? And here's this guy, Jack Dawson, who said, hey, I had this idea. Jack's ready to quit. I think he's ready to go on a boat and travel around the world. And he's like, I've been playing around with this. So they go, all right, here's, you know, take two weeks and work on this project. Before you know it, you know, Twitter's born. I mean, the reason they stopped working what they were working on podcasts is because Apple came into the space. So that never would have happened. Or Facebook. I mean, think about the odds of that happening. You know, had Mark, as I said earlier, signed that confidential information invention, of Scott, he wouldn't have had any rights to the project. So the twins would have done it and probably screwed it up. So you never would have been a Facebook. And Google, these guys were running around. I mean, Chris Dixon just talked about this at the startup school. Go, you know, from six weeks ago. You could go look on YouTube and watch smart guy Chris Dixon. The guys at Google were trying to sell the company for a million dollars, okay? 
They were trying to get out of the space. They were, they were done. No one wanted it for a million dollars. A million dollars. I'm not kidding. You know, this is all public record. So my point I'm making is nobody knows anything. Okay? Nobody knows anything. Don't, you know, so don't think they do. Yes, they have an edge. It's like the hedge fund guys on Wall Street. They have an edge because this is what they do. Some of the guys there are trading on inside information, but that's different. But that's sort of what the VC guys are, you know, they're doing. It's inside information in the sense that they're seeing things before, you know, you are. They're sort of in the mix. They're getting the best deals, the best entrepreneurs. But at the end of the day, no one really knows anything. That's, you know, that's sort of my premise. It's not a, you know, I don't, you know, I don't mean to be, um, you know, negative here, but I think that's a positive thing in the sense that everybody has a shot at this. You know, you just have to, you know, hang in there and get a little lucky. Yes. I guess the second question I wanted to go back to is you mentioned kind of the mess that's happening around crowdfunding right now. Yeah, exactly. To, um, and I would imagine that you're talking in regards to Washington, correct? Mm -hmm. Legislation. Yeah, or, well, we're still waiting for the SEC to promulgate the rules, the yeah. final rules, how to utilize crowdfunding. But I'm saying it's a mess because they've made it so complicated. You have to use a funding portal yeah. or a broker dealer. You've got to follow this stuff. At the end of the day, it's not going to make a lot of sense. You have to file. If you raise more than five hundred thousand dollars, for example, uh, you'd have to provide your investors with audited financial statements. I mean, what the hell is that? How am I going to get audited? Finan I'm a startup, for God's sake. So it may be ideal for like a bar or a restaurant. You know, it's been around for a little bit of time, but I don't know if it's going to work for startups. Plus, I, I get concerned when I got a hundred, two hundred. You know, stockholders, you know, some lawyer is going to be, plaintiff's lawyers are going to sue you if you do well and stuff like that. It seems like, though, but to, and again, I have no knowledge of that, but to keep cap tables clean, the, the model would eventually look, um, uh, so for instance, somebody does something on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. you have all these people go in, and it's, um, instead of having it be a syndicate model where you're having, you know, maybe five or six big angels come in, you're going to have it look more like what a traditional yeah, ideally, but I don't think they're allowing that. That's okay. that's the issue. That's a good point. I'm so, send you over there, then, Washington. <laughs> no, the point he's raising is what's doing, what's going on in AngelList now. As many of you know, there's so-called syndicates. Um, a syndicate is basically you know a guy like Jason puts together a group of people to invest in your startup, and then on the cap table it's just one entity. They set up in like an LLC, uh, and so that's great, right? Let them figure out how they want to vote, how to deal with it. I'm only dealing with this one entity. With the crowdfunding, the problem is you may end up with, you know, 200 individuals each kicking in $100 or $1,000. Who, who the hell wants that? Then you have all kinds of issues, having stockholders meeting, how to communicate. The, there was a push to see if we can fold them all into a similar type of LLC. But I've, I've read that, uh, and we'll see what happens, how it comes out. But Yeah, that. right, because that's the key, like you just said. So um, I think we covered five. five. The last one, which I, as I said, was just sort of dilly. It, it, it's a very broad concept, and this is. So I get the, you know, getting the calls. It, it you know, it breaks your heart sometimes when uh, you know entrepreneur calls you up and says, "Hey, this investor's trying to screw me." Turns out, you know, the entrepreneur didn't get a lawyer involved, and you know, the investor had his lawyer draft everything. The investor controls the board, and the investor's you know firing the entrepreneur as a CEO, and all because. You know, the entrepreneur got very excited, right? Someone waved some cash. They said, you know, fine, I'll just sign. I just need the money. God, I need the money, right? And then, you know, things sour because not only did he not get a lawyer, but he didn't really ask around and say, who is this guy? Now, for the high profile, for the high profile investors, obviously that's usually not an issue. Or the, you know, the typical, you know, A investor, you don't worry about that. But, you know, sometimes you don't have that luxury, right? It's just like you're going out to Montana. You don't know. These guys haven't even done this stuff. Let's assume they've done a few other deals. You'd want to call up those you know, CEOs and founders. Hey, how are these guys to work with? Maybe they're assholes, excuse my French. You know, or maybe they're busting your ass, or maybe they're trying to cheat you. I don't know. But that's what I'm saying. You've got to do your due diligence with, with everybody you're involved in. I mean, that's something you can do. Go on the web. You know, figure out, have these guys been doing investments? I'm trying to bring in a new co-founder. I mean, it's the same thing like just you know, getting references. That's what you want to do. Talk to people. When you hire somebody, right, you're going to do the same thing. The thing is with investors, I mean, it's, people say, oh, you're going to be married to your investor. You're not, you're not married because you can't divorce them. At least with a co-founder, you can get divorced if you set up the proper vesting schedule you know, to kick out. You're not divorcing your investor. He's there. I mean, you know, and these guys can play havoc. So that really bothers me. And that's, um, you know, that's really just you know, up to you to say, hey, I'm excited for the money. 
you know, I'm thinking with my head now, and I'm going to, you know, get a lawyer involved, and I'm going to, you know, talk to people and make sure that this investor is going to be, you know, a good partner. So, um, so good. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's appropriate time, but can you give us a, a snapshot of your firm and what you specialize in, the industries and such, and then maybe give us just a little bit more uh, color on the, as you mentioned, the startup program or, or, or package that you have? Yeah, well, I was, in fact, I was going to talk for a minute before uh, Jason's uh, interview, but, um, you know, I'd worked at a couple big firms in New York for about eight years, and I kind of saw this problem. Uh, and, the, and the problem is that for, for many entrepreneurs and startups, particularly in New York, I mean, out here is a little better, but, you know, you, the big firms often just don't work. I mean, so you go to the big firm, you know, you meet, meet with the senior guy and the partner, you sign your engagement letter, and then uh, all of a sudden all your work's pushed down, you know, to some young associate with little or no experience. I know this because I was there and I saw this. In New York, it's, boy, I remember as a first-year associate, they're throwing me the $20 million M&A deals. And I don't know what I'm doing. The party doesn't want to. He's, he's doing these billion dollar deals, and I'm just sort of winging it. So I'm saying, this is, this is screwed up. But for, for startups, I mean, even in New York, most of the big firms won't even work with startups. But, but out here, um, you know, you end up sort of paying for the, um, for this, for the sort of on the job training of the associates, which is, which is crazy. So I, I just tried to come up with a different business model. I worked in New York for eight years, came out here, and launched my own firm. Uh, with a different model geared specifically for entrepreneurs and startups. So, for example, we only have lawyers. Uh, we only have lawyers with 10 to 25 years experience. So, that's different than the big firm. Big firms are big business, big factories. They make a lot of money by representing public companies and hedge funds and private equity firms. We work with entrepreneurs and startups. We have a different model. We strip out the overhead. So, basically, you know, we can give the same. Not that we compete on price, but it turns out to be the same rates. You know, a ten, guy with 10 or 15 years experience as a first year associate. We don't have all that overhead. The fancy offices and the you know, large support staff and all the, you know, crazy compensation. So um, that's kind of my firm in a nutshell. We got 12 lawyers. What's nice at a boutique firm is, you know, law becomes somewhat specialized like medicine. And so, you know, you call me up, hey, I got this project, uh, I have an IP issue, a trademark registration. Should we get an IP lawyer to help you? I got a financing, we got a few people who really specialize in financing. The startup package, which I mentioned earlier, a lot of people have utilized. What's nice is just one flat fee. So you get unlimited phone calls and emails. You know, that's the other problem, you know, I hear a lot, you know, entrepreneurs call me up. You know, I like my lawyer, but every time I pick up the phone, they're charging me 500 bucks or whatever it is, you know. So, um, you know, we try to encourage you to, you know, speak to us. We, we work across all industries. I don't, I think with most of the documents, it, it's sort of, you know, industry neutral. It happens that I spend most of my time here, so most of our clients are tech, you know, tech software, apps. I mean, it's, it's, this is an amazing environment. You know, on, a lot of entrepreneurs, I get calls from all around the country, and the problem is they don't have a, you know, money in these places, you know, whether it's Chicago, just not a lot of investors. Out here, I mean, this is, there's so much opportunity out here. I think the hard thing is just getting out and networking and sort of getting those relationships, and it's hard. It takes a lot of time, but the fact is, I mean, this is the best time ever to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I think the way to go is to try to find a really good co-founder and, and work best with two people where one person is sort of like the Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak team, where you know, one guy's working, you know, coding up the site, working on the technical person, and the other person is out there hustling, you know, trying to build a relationship, because it's hard to do both. You know, that's the thing. I mean, that's the reality. So I always hear most of the experts, Paul Graham and others, talk about you know, two being the best. Mark Susta talks about one being just fine. Um, it's, just, it's hard to be you know, just one person. Uh, yes? Oh, no. Oh, OK. Oh, this is like, uh, you know, in the auction. You know, you're not uh, any other bidders. So uh, I think we covered a lot of ground here. I apologize for uh, all the information, but it was just, the idea is just to kind of walk out of here and, you know, never talk to a lawyer again. No, to try to, you know, say, hey, okay, now I'm familiar with a few of these issues. I'm not going to make this mistake. Uh, that's the key. I mean, I always tell people, you know, I get the call and they've made a mistake. I said, look, we all make mistakes. I've made plenty of mistakes, but you've got to learn from it. You know, I had one guy, he sold, he got screwed by the investor, he ended up selling his company for, I mean, he made okay money, you know, a few hundred thousand, but he, he could have really sold for like, you know, four, I think 40 million, it was something crazy. He got a 10, or I don't know what the number was. But then he goes ahead, and he does like the same, I got a call like a year later, he's like, these documents, Scott, can you look at these documents? I'm like, what, where, what is this coming? You know, he sends me the PDF, he said, oh, you know, I, I went ahead and just signed it. I was like, look, I, I can't even represent, I just couldn't believe it. You know, so if you do that, I mean, it's like, yeah. Oh, I wanted to save some money. You know, I only got like 400000 from the deal. I'm like, you know, forget it, dude. You know, you're done. Yeah, so just learn from your mistakes. I mean, it's not, it's not rocket science, but some of this stuff can really mess you up. Uh, 
as you indicate. What's your name? Alma. Alma. Okay, Alma. So tell us some more mistakes you've made. <laughs> so you were practicing law. Was that a mistake? No. Okay. That was, I love practicing law. So then you. Yeah, I do too. So that's great. So were you here in the city? Or? No, I was a litigator in New York. Oh, oh cool. A litigator. Wow. Okay. Anybody have any disputes? Are you still practicing or no? No, no, no. no. Oh. I developed the knowledge management software for litigators. Oh, oh for litigators. That's great. Yeah, so that's my startup. Wow, good for you. And uh, so let's see. Partnered with my best friend. Went 50-50. Didn't document the IP. Wrote the schedule. Oh my God. <laughs> this is from Gibson, Gibson Dunn. A lit this is one of the best firms in the world, Gibson Dunn, particularly for litigation. I think Gibson, Gibson Dunn represented Facebook and Mark Zucker to show you how good they are. That's my former boss and mentor, Oh, really? Oh, great. That was a great result, too. That could have been nasty. Were you guys involved also with that crazy, uh, who was that crazy guy who was suing Mark? They, it turned out to be uh, fraud. No, there was a guy in upstate New York who claimed yeah. Mark's... Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, okay. That's, that's the case that... Oh, yeah. that you guys broke. That was amazing. Everybody know that case? There was just this wacky guy who, who claimed that Mark Zuckerberg uh, basically gave him 80% of the equity or something. Well, well he did a... Mark did a project for him, and so there was a contract. Right. And he... He actually forged... He changed the contract and <laughs> forged it. And so they were able to go into it that was amazing. That had been deleted like 10 times, but they found it on the guy's computer. Wow. And then he had, he had a good firm representing him, too. That was crazy, didn't he? Initially, a th big firm. He had like three different firms because each firm kept taking it on and then realizing it was full of shit. Right. Yeah, litigation is, we don't do litigation. Uh, litigation is a completely different world. You, you know, the best litigators are in New York, you're like a junkyard dog. I mean, literally, these guys just battle. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't stomach that, but uh, it, can, it, can, it can be exciting at times, you know, being a litigator. You must have worked pretty hard there, Gibson Dunn, New York. Yeah, but it, was, it was a lot of fun. Good training. I mean, the partner I worked with was the one I mentioned. That's great. He was, you know, top of his game and a lot of fun to work with. So then you came out here to uh, launch your startup? Oh, six weeks we're, ago. We're based wow. in New York still. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not here. Oh, great. We're doing LLC in New York. Oh, excellent. Yeah. What's the name Allegory? of the Allegory. Allegory. So this is for litigating. Litigation. Okay. Right now it's focused on litigation, but we're going to start tailoring it to the corporate side as well. Oh, that's great. So you learn from your mistakes. How I, I have learned Smar a lot. A smart lawyer doesn't get a lawyer. <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter who you are, you know. She's like uh, as well trained as you can get in law, and she doesn't hire a lawyer to help her with her documents. Okay. Well, you, what did you use, legal Zoom? That was, that was actually another mistake. <laughs> that my co-founder was from the corporate side and assured me that she knew all the corporate stuff. So she oh, okay. Oh, so she was I like. So were you a Delaware corporation at least? Oh, okay. Oh, so you have investors. That's great. How was that? Raising money? Um, it, it went fine. Is it angel it was, round? It was fine when we raised the money. It was people who knew us. Um, it was not so fine when, our, uh, when we started shooting. But now so, it's all so, good. Oh, so you, oh, you bought, so you bought her out and everything's fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We settled the lawsuit. Oh, great. She retained some equity. I gave her some cash. Oh, she actually sued. Wow, this is, okay, the next workshop, you have to come. <laughs> oh my God. This is amazing. This is your co-founder who is, well, that's great. Now, are you allowed to talk? Maybe you have like a non, uh, no, I'm allowed to talk. Oh, okay, so next workshop, you have to come. They, you guys probably think I set this up, I'm telling you. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, next one I'm setting up, you walk in late again. I'll be like, oh, you're here for the workshop? Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Anybody have any other questions? I think, uh, I think we covered a lot of ground. And we have our star here, the star lawyer and uh, new entrepreneur. So, uh, so cool. Well, thanks very much, everyone. That was great. Yeah, thank you. All right.